Hello, this is Richard Hammock's Calculus One course. We are in part five of the course on integration. Today in lecture 40, we'll talk about a class of problems called initial value problems. All of this follows immediately from our work in the previous lecture, 39. So let's begin with a recap of that. Remember that the indefinite integral of a function f is the set of all functions whose derivatives equal f. You might think of the indefinite integral of f as the set of all antiderivatives of f. The indefinite integral of f is denoted by this grouping of symbols, which we read as the integral of f of x dx. And it stands for the indefinite integral, the set of all functions whose derivatives equal f. And this takes the form of another function, big F of x, plus a constant c, where if you took the derivative of big F of x, you'd get little f of x. So therefore, if you take the derivative of big F of x plus c, the derivative of the constant c is 0, and you get little f of x. So this big F of x plus c is a set of infinitely many different functions, a different function for every constant. It's the set of all functions whose derivative equals little f of x. The process of finding this indefinite integral is called integration. And you'll remember that integration is the reverse process of differentiation. If you start with the function little f of x and you integrate it, to get the indefinite integral big F of x plus c, and then differentiate that, you get back to the little f of x. Alternatively, starting with big F of x plus c, differentiating and integrating gets you right back where you started. You can think of the process of differentiation and integration as undoing each other. They're opposites. So consequently, Whenever you're working out an antiderivative, or I'm sorry, an indefinite integral, the integral of little f of x dx, and you get a proposed answer, big F of x plus c, and you're not sure about your answer, you can always check your work by differentiating the answer big F of x plus c and checking to see if you got little f of x. And if you do, you did your work right. In lecture 39, we came up with a host of integration formulas. For every differentiation rule, we had a corresponding integration formula by running that rule in reverse. For example, we have the power rule for integration. The integral of x to the power of n dx is 1 over n plus 1 times x to the power of n plus 1 plus a constant. Because if you differentiate the 1 over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1 plus c, using the power rule, you'll get x to the power of n. This list continues with rules that come from our inverse trig functions. For example, the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx equals tangent inverse of x plus c, because if you differentiate tangent inverse of x plus c, you'll get 1 over 1 plus x squared, and so on. There's a constant multiple rule for integration and a sum difference rule for integration. So at this point, you've worked a lot of exercises and you're getting good at this and you're developing a facility for integration. That's it for the recap. Let's get on with the lecture. We'll start with an example that illustrates our main topic for today, initial value problems. If you're trying to find, if, you, if you've got a function and you know that's the derivative of some other function, and you're trying to find the function that gives you that derivative, you know that in taking the antiderivative you get a plus c, so you, you don't really have a concrete function because you don't necessarily know what c is. But sometimes there will be an additional piece of information that might tell you what that c is. 
And this example indicates that kind of problem. And that additional information is sometimes called an initial value. So this type of problem is called an initial value problem. Like this. Suppose f of x is a function with f prime of x equals 1 over x plus 3x. And in addition, f of 1 equals 5. Now, from those two pieces of information about f, that its derivative is 1 over x plus 3x, and the fact that f of 1 equals 5, what we want to do in this problem is to find what f of x is. So I think you can probably see how we would at least start to go about that. Because this function f of x that we don't quite know yet has a derivative that we do know, it's 1 over x plus 3x, that f of x is an antiderivative of this f prime of x equals 1 over x plus 3x. So that f of x is going to be the integral of 1 over x plus 3x dx. Um, and this 3x, let me write that as 3x to the power of 1, just to emphasize that we're going to use the in finding this integral, we're going to use the power rule for integration on this term. So we get, first of all, the antiderivative of 1 over x is ln of x, ln of absolute value of x. Then we have a constant multiple of 3 times, now here comes the power rule for integration. We're integrating x to the power of 1. So the power rule for integration says you get 1 over n plus 1. That's 1 over 1 plus 1 times x to the power of n plus 1, x to the power of 1 plus 1, and then plus c. Cleaning that up, f of x is ln of absolute value of x plus 3 halves x squared plus c. So that sort of tells us what our f of x is. Remember, the problem was to find f of x. We've got a pretty good idea of what f of x looks like, except we don't know what number c is. If we really want f of x, we've got to have it completely. We've got to figure out what number is this c. Right now, that c could stand for any number, any constant. We need to know what it is. So to continue and solve this problem completely, we need to find c. So I'm going to go up to the other side here. Now, to find c, that's where we use this one piece of information that we haven't used yet, the so-called initial value, the fact that f of 1 equals 5. We know that piece of information about f. So let's write it down. f of 1 equals 5. Now down here we had a pretty good idea of what f of f, but what f of x is, everything except the c. Um, but we could figure out, we could just go ahead and plug in the one into this expression for f of x, and that gives us ln of one plus three halves one squared plus c. All of that's f of one. And notice we we didn't we still don't know what c is, but we, we're just kind of faking it with some number c. So let's just leave it as c, since we don't know what it is. And all of that is equal to 5, which we bring down here. But notice now that we have an equation where it's all numbers except for one unknown, which is the c. And we can solve for that. Now, ln of the absolute value of 1 is ln of 1. That's 0. Then plus 3 halves plus c equals 5. And let's solve for c now. c is going to be equal to 5 minus 3 halves. Get a common denominator there. 5 is 10 over 2 minus 3 over 2. And you can see here that our c, which we didn't know over here and we wanted to find, is now seen to be 7 halves. And that completely tells us what f of x is. f of x is the function ln of the absolute value of x plus 3 halves x squared, plus 7 halves. And you can check it. That is a function whose derivative is this, 1 over x plus 3x, and also f of 1 equals 5. I won't say the words, but you can go through and check that both of these properties hold true for this f.
So we've solved the problem. Finally, today, I want to revisit motion on a line, which we studied previously, and we're going to update this with our new knowledge gleaned from section 4.9. You'll remember that in a situation where we have an object, in this case, let's say a car, moving on a straight line, in this case a road, we tend to think of that motion is being described with a position function, s of t. So s of t tells how far the object is from a fixed point at time t. So if this car is driving down the road as time increases, s of t is going to be a function that increases. And we know from um, what we did back in chapter 3 that given this setup, the velocity at time t is v of t, which is s prime of t. Velocity equals derivative of position. And we also have acceleration at time t. It's a function a of t, that's the rate of change of velocity. It's v prime of t. So this is the state of our knowledge back in chapter 3. But we can update this now with our new perspective from chapter 4. Going backwards here, if v of t, um, if, if a of t is v prime of t, That would mean v of t is an antiderivative of acceleration. Velocity of t is a function whose derivative equals acceleration. So summing that up, velocity is the integral of a of t dt. And that's correct again because the derivative of velocity equals a of t. And furthermore, taking that one level higher, the derivative of position is velocity, which would mean that position s of t is an antiderivative of velocity. So s of t equals the integral of v of t dt. So we've updated our formulas now. We can now get um, from, we can, instead of going down from s derivative to v of t, take a derivative a of t, we can start to go back up. The antiderivative of a of t is velocity. The antiderivative of velocity is position. So let's work a problem involving that. And this involves uh, straight line motion, except it's going to be up and down. A ball is tossed straight up. So here's the picture. Uh, this, this ball is just tossed straight up. There's no wind. The ball just goes straight up. And it has a constant acceleration of minus 32 feet per second. Um, and actually, that should read 32 feet per second per second. My mistake. So this is the acceleration due to gravity. Um, but you don't really need to know that. That's just minus 32 feet per second. Per second. That's, take that as a fact. Now, furthermore, at time t equals 0, the velocity is 20 feet per second. And the object is 5 feet high. So here you are at time t equals 0. The ball is 5 feet above the ground. And you might think about that as you're tossing it straight up. And as you toss it up and it starts to go up at 20 feet per second, your hand is five feet off the ground and the ball starts to go up like that. And the problem is to find the position function s of t. What is this function? Well, let's see. 
we want to find s of t, and we have an initial velocity of 20 feet per second, but the only function that's really given to us is this acceleration is constant. It's minus 32 feet per second. So we have acceleration, and we want position, so we could start taking antiderivatives to try to get from acceleration to velocity and up to position to answer our question. So let's first of all go from acceleration to velocity. We know that velocity is the integral of acceleration. V of t equals the integral of a of t dt. And that a of t is minus 32. That was given to us in the setup of the problem. OK, now we can use our integration formulas. Remember the integral of kt, uh, the integral of k dt was k times t. So the integral of minus 32 dt is going to be minus 32 times t plus c. If you're in doubt, you can check it. Take the derivative of minus 32 t plus c, and sure enough, you do get minus 32. So what do we have here? We just figured out our velocity was, or is, 32 t plus c. And our goal here is now, you know, when we get velocity, we want to integrate that and get up to position, since position is the integral of velocity. But notice we don't quite have velocity yet because we don't know what this c is. We need to find it before moving on. So how would we find it? Well, notice in the setup of the problem, we have an initial value. At time t equals 0, the velocity is 20 feet per second. So that means 20 equals velocity at time 0. 20 feet per second equals v of 0. And right above here, we have v of t is minus 32t plus c. So v of 0 would be minus 32 times 0 plus c. And look what that gives us. 20 equals 0 plus c, or 20 equals c. And we now have figured out what our velocity function is. It's minus 32t plus c, where the c is equal to 20. So v of t equals minus 32t plus 20. OK, we've successfully found our velocity function. And remember, our plan is we want to find this function s of t. We've got velocity. We're going to integrate velocity because s of t is the integral of v of t dt. So our next step is to say s of t is the integral of v of t dt, which according to our previous line is the integral of minus 32t plus 20. And now we can use our integration rules to find this integral. Let's see. Um, let's see. This is a t to the power of one here, so its antiderivative would be t to the one plus one over one plus one, or whatever one plus one t to the power of one plus one. That's one half t squared, and that one half times the thirty-two would be sixteen. So what we get here is minus 16t squared plus 20t, the antiderivative of 20 is 20t, plus a constant. Now whenever you do an integral like this, you can always pause and check your work. Is it really correct to double check your work? Take the derivative of your answer, the derivative of minus 16t squared plus 20t plus c, and see if it really does give you this integrand. In this case, it does. 2 times minus 16 is 32 times t. And the derivative of 20t is 20. So we're good. So what we have here is s of t equals minus 16t squared plus 20t plus a constant c. So we've almost got our answer. We wanted to find s of t, but we don't know what c is yet. So is there a piece of information that we haven't used yet? 
Well, up here in the setup of the problem, it says that at time t equals c, the velocity is 20 feet per second, and the object is 5 feet high. So that would mean that at time t equals 0, the object is 5 feet high. In other words, s of 0 is equal to 5. So 5 equals s of 0. Um, and from the line above, we can see exactly what s of 0 would be. Just plug in 0, minus 16 times 0 squared, plus 20 times 0, plus c. And if you look at that, there's a bunch of zeros, and you have 5 equals equals 0 plus 0 plus c. So c equals 5 when you get rid of all the zeros. And now we've figured out our position function. S of t is minus 16t squared plus 20t plus c, where that c we just found out was 5. So in the box is the answer to our question. Find the position function S of t that's drawn here. At time t, the ball is this high off the ground. It's at a height of S of t equals minus 16 t squared plus 20 t plus 5. Our next example will illustrate how integration can be used to work out the mechanics of a suspension bridge. Like for instance, London's Tower Bridge as illustrated here. What's happening is that you have a road or platform that's horizontal. And the weight of that platform is distributed evenly horizontally. It might be something like, I don't know, a thousand kilograms per meter or something like that, distributed evenly throughout this stretch. And that platform is being supported by a cable that runs between two towers with vertical cables connected to it. And what we want to do in this problem is to show that the shape of this supporting cable, the suspended cable, is actually a parabola. It has the form of y equals ax squared plus c, where a and c are appropriate constants. So we want to show that a cable supporting a load distributed horizontally has the form of a parabola. Our solution will use a little bit of physics, and if you're not familiar with that, you can, you're, you can ignore this example and you'll be fine. But let's see if we can figure this out. Look at the situation and put it on a graph. Let's say that our cable is put on the graph so that its lowest point is right there at the origin. And we don't know what shape this cable takes, so let's just call it y equals f of x. And the idea is we want to figure out what f of x is. Let's say that this end is attached securely to a tower, and the other end over here is attached to a tower, and um, we're really going to pay attention starting at this origin point right there where the slope to y equals f of x is horizontal. And for that segment of the cable illustrated here, we have vertical cables running down to, you might think of them as evenly distributed weights as illustrated here, connected to the cable and they pull it into a certain shape, y equals f of x, that we want to find. So if you think about what's going on here, at this point right there, that cable is pulling the other side of the cable with some force. The connecting cable here has to pull with some force f that's horizontal. Let's just call that force F. Now we want to work out F of X. So imagine this whole system is in balance now with this one force F 
pulling the cable backwards and everything is still. And imagine you go to the x-axis right here, maybe an x that's right there, and you go up to the cable and imagine cutting that cable right there at x. And what you're going to do is you're going to hold it together. Your left hand is holding the left side of the cable and your right hand is holding the right cable together. And so you've got to pull those two together with a certain force. And right here, your left hand is pulling this cable with the force that's tangent to the cable. Some force that's denoted as T, T for tangent. And this whole system is in balance. Let's think about this tangent force T. Everything is in balance, so the horizontal component has to balance out the horizontal component F here. This has to be a horizontal component of minus F, F in the other direction. And then there's also a vertical component to T. We'll denote it in green. And think about what that is. That's the upward force, the upward component of T. And that has to counterbalance the weights that are pulling this whole system down. And so what is the weight of these green weights here? Well, they're distributed horizontally. You've got a distance of x. And let's say that the weights are oh, a constant of w kilograms per unit of x. So we have x units here. So the total weight would be w times x. So this green force is wx. Now, we are looking for the function f of x. Notice we're getting some information about its tangent, in other words, about its derivative. If you think about this x right here and going up, and this could be any x, just take this one, go up to this point, this red force vector is tangent to the graph of f of x. So its slope is equal to f prime of x. And notice that we have rise over run here. So f prime of x is going to be rise, wx, divided by run, which is the magnitude of negative f. Let's write that down. From the picture, we see that f prime of x equals wx divided by the length of minus f. Now, in this setup, w is a constant. It's the weight per unit of x of this platform. And remember that f is a constant, too. Um, it's a constant force. Everything is in balance here. We started out with f being the force that this lowest point is pulling the other side of the cable with. That's a constant. So w divided by the length of f is a constant. So this equation has the form of f prime of x equals k times x. So look at that. We have information about the derivative of f. We set out to find out what f of x is. And from the system here, we got information about its derivative. f prime of x equals k times x. We want to find f. We know what its derivative is. So we can find f by integrating its derivative. f of x would be the integral of k times x, dx. And that's easy because it's a constant k times x. We can get that with the power rule and the constant multiple rule for integration. The integral of kx dx is k times x squared over 2 plus c. And k over 2 is a constant. Let's just call that a. We get f of x equals ax squared plus c. So the equation of the, the equation of the curve for the supporting cable is y equals f of x. 
where f of x is a parabola ax squared plus c. So we've just shown that in a suspension bridge supporting a load distributed horizontally, that supporting cable takes the form of a parabola ax squared plus c for appropriate constants. So we're done. In this problem, we analyzed the situation and we came up with information about a derivative, an equation involving a derivative, and from there we could solve for our function f. And that basic setup, where you have information about a derivative and you find f, is actually the basis for a very extensive subject called differential equations. And typically, you might, if you're, a, um, if you're studying mathematics or engineering, after a couple of semesters of calculus, you'll take a course in differential equations. The work you're doing in this course is getting you ready for that. We've just seen that a cable supporting a load distributed horizontally takes the form of a parabola. I want to point out that if you suddenly cut all of these supporting cables here, the vertical ones, and took away all the weights, so all you had was a cable freely hanging, that would change the shape of this graph. It wouldn't be a parabola anymore. Although we're not going to work out the details of it here, I want to point out that a freely hanging cable, like one that's attached here and there, and is just freely suspended and not supporting any load other than itself, is not a parabola. And you can use differential equations. It's a little more involved than what we did here, but not much. You can use differential equations to show that this curve has the form of y equals a constant a times e to the x plus e to the minus x plus b. And that's definitely not a parabola. It is a well-known shape that's well-studied. It actually has a name. It's called a catenary. Catenaries appear a lot in engineering and also in architecture. The St. Louis Arch, designed by Aero Saarinen, has the form of an inverted catenary. He also designed Dulles Airport, whose roof has the form of a catenary. And the Catalonian architect Ant Antoni Gaudi used catenaries extensively in his work. If you search for Gaudi and catenary, you'll come up with lots of information on that. And that might be a starting point for further investigation. That's it for today. We've investigated initial value problems and we've had a peek at differential equations. Coming up next, we're going to move on to lecture 41 with what seems like an entirely different topic. We're going to look at area under a curve. Given a function f of x and two numbers a and b on the x-axis, how many square units of area are contained here in the shaded region? This looks like it has nothing to do with antiderivatives, but we'll see that it's intimately connected with antiderivatives. I'll see you next time, and goodbye.